Okay. Whenever you are ready. Oh yeah, and if you have visual aids, that's just how you do it. Sure. It's like, won't let me. Um, I'm sorry, I think I need to pull it up like this. There we go. Okay, let me try it again. Okay. Okay. Can you all see that? Yep, perfect. Okay. All right, great. Um, then I guess I will uh, go ahead and start. In March of last year, my husband and I found out great news. We discovered we were expecting our second child. We were completely thrilled about this. However, what we did not know at the time was that over the course of the next seven or eight months, our lives as we knew it would be completely turned upside down. And in the end, both myself and my unborn daughter would be fighting for our very lives. That is why I'm here today to discuss with you the illness hyperemesis gravidorum or HG is as, as it is commonly referred to as. Today, I would like to discuss with you all, first of all, what exactly HG is, secondly, what the proposed causes for HG are, and lastly, what the treatment options available for those with HG are. In order to begin, let's go ahead and discuss a little bit um, about what HG is. The National Institute of Health defines hyperemesis gravidorum as extreme persistent nausea and vomiting during pregnancy, which can lead to dehydration, weight loss, and electrolyte imbalances. So now that we have a working medical definition of what exactly hyperemesis gravidorum is, let's go ahead and take a look at some of the symptoms of hyperemesis gravidorum. As you can see from the chart provided by the Help Her Foundation, hyperemesis gravidorum, although commonly confused with normal morning sickness, is not more normal morning sickness in any sort of way. In fact, most women with HG will find that they will lose an upwards of 5% or more of their pre-pregnancy body weight. And additionally, their nausea and vomiting will be constant and severe, and excuse me, severe, some women will find that they will puke in upwards to 20 times or more a day. And uh, this will often lead them to be disabled and bedridden and completely unable to care for themselves or their family. So as you can see from the chart here, there, although there are similarities, hyperemesis gravidorum is generally much more severe and requires medical intervention. So now that we know a little bit about what HG is, let's go ahead and look at some of the proposed medical and socioeconomical causes for hyperemesis gravidorum. I use the word proposed here because currently there is no cause for HG. Um, and Anthony de Summers in his article, Emergency Management of Hyperemesis Gravidorum, discusses some of the medical and socioeconomical causes which may contribute to one getting HG. Medical causes include high levels of the pregnancy hormone HCG, which has been found to increase nausea and vomiting among women. Women with HG or hyperemesis gravidorum often have high levels of this hormone. Additionally, Summers has found that an astounding two out of third or two out of three cases of HG um, women have an overactive thyroid. And lastly, um, he says that another medical cause includes genetic factors. In fact, he found in one study that one out of three women had a mother that also had HG. In addition to medical causes, he also discusses some socioeconomical causes. These include becoming pregnant at a young age, which is defined as 21 years or younger, being overweight or underweight at the time of conception, and smoking as well. So now that we know a little bit about the proposed medical and socioeconomical causes for hyperemesis gravidorum, let's go ahead and turn to the treatment options for those who have HG. 
Dr. Lindsay Wagirzenik discusses the two categories of treatments for HG in her article, Treatments for Hyperemesis Gravidorum. She claims there are two categories, as I've said, which include medications and or specialized medical procedures. To begin with, let's go ahead and take a closer look at some of the common medications Wigirzenik states are used in order to treat HG. These include the drugs promethazine and Zofran, which are basically both anti-emetic or anti-nausea medications. Additionally, some women will be given steroids such as prednisone, hydrocodone, or solumedrol as well to treat their HG. However, in severe cases, sometimes women do not respond to any of these medications, in which case um, doctors will look to specialized medical procedures in order to treat HG, as well as keep the woman and her, her unborn child alive. Um, some of these special medical procedures, which Wigerzenik cites is a PIC line or a peripherally inserted central catheter and a nasogastric tube. Let's go ahead and take a closer look at both of these. A PIC line um, is essentially a semi-permanent IV which is inserted through the arm and threaded in the vein and goes up into near the heart. It essentially provides um, continuous nourishment and fluids for women who are unable to keep down either. However, it does run with a high risk of infection. So oftentimes, doctors will choose uh, to look to a nasogastric tube instead in order to treat hyperemesis gravidorum. An NG tube is basically a feeding tube. And what it is is a feeding tube, a small tube, which is inserted through your nose and goes down into your stomach or your nasojejunum. Um, as you can see from the pictures here off to the right, this is actually what I was given in my last month of pregnancy. Um, and it's essentially what saved both me and my daughter's life. Without it, we wouldn't have lived. So now that we know a little bit more about what hyperemesis gravidorum is, what its proposed causes are, and what its treatments are, I'd like to conclude with the thought that education can save lives. Um, Research has found that awareness and education and early intervention is extremely important for women with hyperemesis gravidorum. So let's not be silent about this disease any longer. And if you or someone you know is suffering from this disease, please seek out medical help as soon as possible. Because in the end, it could quite possibly save a life, as you see here with me and my beautiful daughter. Thanks, nice, uh... Sorry, my dog barked. Oh, oh it's okay. <laughs> Which is ironically what I'm talking about, so. <laughs> Good interruption. The first day when I like, when we had meetings where just, we checked out the Zoom room. Mm -hmm. um, I logged on with someone, she actually dropped a class. I don't, I don't know why, we had a good chat, but <laughs> anyways, <laughs> she turned her like Zoom room on. And she was, we were, I was looking at her feet. She was just like chilling on her bed. And she was like, oh, I mean, you're looking at my feet. <laughs> like switched it around. So dog barking is not the weirdest thing. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Lauren or Zach, who wants to go next? I'll go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Whenever you're ready. What do Queen Victoria, Picasso, John Wayne, and Adele all have in common? Well, believe it or not, all of these people at some point in time were dachshund owners. Dachshunds have a long and rich history, and many people have had the privilege of owning these little sausage-shaped dogs, including myself. Um, I have only ever owned dachshunds and have always been particularly interested in their history and breeding, so much so that I even remember writing a similar paper when I was in like third grade. So <laughs> uh, today I would like to give a brief history of dachshunds and go over some general time periods um, that can comprehensively sum this history. So today I would like to talk about the origin of the dachshund, some significant events in their early history, and some current day dachshund facts. So we'll begin at the origin. Uh, interestingly enough, there's a lot of speculation on the origin of the dachshund and some theories that surround it. Uh, the first theory is that they originated in Egypt. Uh, there's been uh, 
drawings of short-legged, long-bodied dogs depicted in tombs that date back hundreds of years. Um, however, an article by The Kennel is skeptical to this theory, saying that though the dogs have dachshund-like characteristics, they can't conclusively state that this is their origin. Uh, another theory, according to a dachshund's owner guide, dachshunds were theorized to originate in Germany over 400 years ago. Um, the belief is that they were bred from a mixture of basset hounds and terriers, um, but some also believe that basset hounds were brought over from France during the French Revolution. Um, so there's a little bit of question as to which country's hounds started the breeding. Um, so now that we've covered some origination theories, we can move into early history. So early history is the largest chunk of time for dachshunds history, and um, for our purposes, we're going to say it's about the 1500s right up until about the 1900s. Um, the Germans were most commonly known for using dachshunds for hunting, and the name dachshund actually translates from German to badger dog. Um, this is because their long bodies are perfect for burrowing um, and digging into badger holes and foxholes. Uh, Anne Gordon from the AKC Gazette notes that dachshunds were commonly used for hunting all the way back um, to the 16th and 17th century. Now, while their uses have more evolved into indoor cuddling, there are cases that um, they were used for hunting even into the early 1900s. Uh, dachshunds started to be more bred as pets than as hunters in the late 1800s and started to be, uh, and they experienced uh, a rise in popularity in Europe. Uh, they were especially uh, popular in uh, royal courts, and that is how Queen Victoria developed her special fondness for the breed. And after this rise in popularity, they finally made their way into America in about 1885. So now that we know a few things that happened in their early history, let's move along the time scale. Um, as early history ends, so begins late history, which I'm referring to as about the 1900s to uh, present day. So dachshunds became very popular in the early 1900s in America, but endured a bit of a setback in popularity around World War II. Uh, people associated the dogs with Nazi Germany um, in a time that anything German really was not favorable. But their popularity bounced back in about in the, like the 1950s. And, and as of today, dachshunds rank sixth out of 155 breeds as the most popular dogs to own in, in the United States. So let's review the three general time frames that sum up the history of dachshunds. Uh, to quote the dachshund-loving Queen Victoria, nothing will turn a man's home into a castle more quickly and effectively than a dachshund. These little dogs are so interesting, and today I talked about a few historical events that happened dur during their origination, their early history, and late history to modern day. I hope you all learned a few things about dachshunds' history and maybe are even inspired to adopt your own. Thank you. All right, that's good. All right. Oops, sorry. So what would you think if the next time you opened up uh, your Wyoming email, you found a love letter waiting for you? Would you click on it? Well, that is what millions of people did in 2000, according to the world's worst viruses in an article published by the Economic Review in 2011. They were using the same email service we do when they received the email. All they had to do was click on the link that disguised itself as a love letter, and in seconds, after, and in seconds their computer was infected with one of the worst computer viruses in history. Computer viruses are a college student's worst nightmare, especially when our whole class that we are paying for is online, waiting for uh, a clever hacker to shut it down. I know that I have been in the situation where you're, where you're halfway through an essay, and your computer crashes and freezes, possibly due to a virus. So after some research on how to protect myself, I want to share today what exactly a computer virus is and a few steps you can take to protect yourself from an attack. So um, because it's important for, to understand uh, what you are protecting yourself from, I want to start by defining what a computer virus is for you. 
So according to author Marshall Brain in his online journal article, How a Computer Virus Works, uh, a computer virus uh, gets its name um, because it shares traits with a real biological virus. He says that people have to create and test um, viruses and then send them out into the world. But like a, like a real biological virus, a computer virus uh, can't reproduce by itself. It has to attach to something else, like a program, and then you have to click on it for it to reproduce just like a sneeze or a cough. Once running though, it can alter or, or destroy anything that it wants to on your computer. Now that we know uh, what a computer virus is, let's talk about the different variations of viruses. There are three main types of viruses. The first is known as a worm. According to the author uh, Fergal Glenn in his article titled uh, Computer Worms, uh, worms can more easily replicate than normal viruses. They can do it automatically um, inside a system, or almost automatically. Uh, they the most commonly attack large computer networks uh, or to steal or delete data. The next virus is known as a, known as a Trojan horse. Marshall Brain uh, also comments on Trojan horses, saying that like the myth, they disguise themselves as something else, um, actually be something different, um, usually something harmful. They commonly disguise as something uh, you download from the internet often, such as music or videos. The third virus is the email virus. Um, obviously, email viruses uh, get to your computer through emails. Uh, they will attack your computer and then also uh, anyone on your con email contact list. They'll send out group emails to everyone on your list and um, to get them to click on the link also to infect their computers. So we have discussed what a computer virus uh, is and the three main types of that you have to watch out for. Now I want to tell you uh, how to protect yourself from them. So just like a virus in real life, um, computer viruses are always evolving. So prevention is a never ending process. But following these tips, you can ensure that you're protecting yourself as best as you can. So Author Brain also suggests that it starts with running a secure operating system. Most people run uh, Mac or Windows, and these are great, uh, but they only work if you consistently update your system, which no one likes to do. According to the world's worst viruses, the next step would be to install an antivirus program. Uh, the most commonly trusted programs are Semantics and McAfee's. Then you need to always be cautious when using the internet. Refrain from downloading programs um, from the internet. Um, author Brain uh, suggests that instead you stick to store-bought CDs um, or download, uh, download keys from trusted websites. Um, you should also use updated internet browsers um, so that they can warn you if you're um, entering an untrusted website. Finally, um, watch your email and think before clicking on any link. I went to Microsoft's um, official website to get their suggestions on how to um, prevent email viruses. And they suggest that even if a email is sent from someone you know, it could still contain a virus um, so just watch whatever links you click, and they also suggest to um, uh, try to resend or reply to the email that you got to see if the sender actually meant to send that email. So now let's review what a computer virus is and how to protect yourself from them. Today we talked about what a computer virus is and the three main types, worms, Trojan horses, and email viruses. We also talked about the different ways to protect yourself such as um, having a secure operating system, installing an antivirus program, and using caution when um, using the internet or clicking links. Computer viruses are often unthought of threat, but as college students, it's, a, it's important uh, to watch out for them. So next time you see a love letter in your email, think twice before reading what it says. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording.